To quote Amit Chaudhary, Calcutta is a work of modern art that neither makes sense nor has utility, but exists for some esoteric aesthetic reason. Perhaps it is this very reason that Delhi Art Gallery decided to showcase its brilliant collection of 18th to 20th century art in Bengal. Whatever the reason may be, one should perhaps not question it but simply be thankful for it. When we asked Mr. Kishore Singh, the head exhibitions and publications of DAG, the pertinent and sort of obvious question, why Calcutta? He couldn't help but wax lyrical about the city's rich cultural heritage. Goodness, why not Kolkata? Isn't Kolkata India's first city of culture? I cannot think of a city that deserves the dedicated museum of art more than Kolkata. Here is a city and its people that celebrate art, are passionate about culture, and express themselves boldly but also with knowledge. Modern art had its genesis here. Look at the very large number of artists that Bengal has contributed to the national discourse. The light may have dimmed for a while when the capital shifted from the erstwhile Calcutta to New Delhi and Bombay became the country's financial center, but Kolkata is regaining eminence as India's art capital, if not in sales, at least in appreciation. Housed in the old currency building, Dag's Bengal art exhibit aptly titled Khore Bayre has already become an important part of the city. Even the venue is perfect. The building sentenced to be demolished in 1994, saved from the clashes of destruction at the last moment by the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, seems oddly fitting for an exhibition on Calcutta's art. Calcutta has seen a resurgence in art. Well, I'm sorry, allow me to contradict myself. Calcutta has always been an artistic city, but now it is finally seeing venues that support these artistic endeavors. Be it the rather newly opened Skinny Moe's Jazz Club on Monohapuku Road or the Top Cat CCU, there is a sudden burst of promising venues that support the local scene. And DAG is one such venue supporting the budding artists. I asked Shimono Chakraborty, the deputy director of Kharabayani, why they chose to host these other cultural events instead of sticking only to the exhibition and her answer showcased the exact mentality that Calcutta needs to possess right now. One of our objectives as a museum exhibition is to use the past to speak to the present moment and the best way to do so was to connect first with the collection and then locate that in the present time through reinterpretation. And the plays and the concerts all help to do that to sort of register where we are now. The second objective for the museum space is to create a sort of platform for the creative community. So the more we can bring in artists and musicians and performers and dancers to come and engage with the art form, it creates a sort of continuation in the artistic legacy. For you see, the local art is not dead, but rather underground, festering in the filth of experimentation and growing stronger. But as a trade-off, more and more obscure like jazz. What Ghore Bayre is trying to do is to bring it back up to the ground and provide it with exposure not only on a state, but on a national level. And it has been a successful endeavor. From bands like Whale in the Pond to plays like Othoi Bapata, the local scene as a whole has accepted and fallen in love with Dag. Even veteran musician Shushmit Bose had nothing but good words to say about Khore Bayre. Now that's enough beating about the bush. Let's talk about Khore Bayre's wonderful collection of art. As one walks down the huge door of the erstwhile Agra Bank, one is faced with two options, to walk down to the open courtyard and marvel at both the agriculture of the building and the beautiful statues housed there, or take a ride and walk up to the staircase to the beautiful paintings of India painted by eminent European artists. I would suggest walking down the courtyard, fawning over the brilliant job done by ASI in restoring the building, appreciating the installments made by DAG, and then briskly walking through the door on the opposite end and entering the Nimai Kosh Gallery. This gallery, chronicling Shatir Rai's journey as a film director through the lens of Nimai Ghosh, is a must-see for each and every cinephile who happens to walk through those doors. Then by all means, turn around and head straight for the staircase. And make sure you don't miss the rare prints of life in India by the Franco-Belgian artist Franz Balthazar Solvens. This is where we are first met with the colonial gaze often found in British paintings of India something that seeped into the psyche of even the Bengali artists of the era. A huge canvas of Chandra Nogal lies attached to a wall. Landscapes, both of nature and of colonial buildings, replete with intricate facades hang in ornamental frames, alongside diaries and books written by colonial big shots, preserved in glass cases. Such is the beauty of the first floor, which also houses indigenous art of the era. 
A common motif throughout the exhibition is the inclusion of paintings done by anonymous artists. These nameless artists, despite their obvious lack in popularity, showcase unparalleled skills and make a wonderful addition to the gallery's housing site. The very pertinent transition from European to Indian art is swift and stark, and takes place after just the first few galleries, and the differences are all the more amplified as one climbs the succeeding flights of stairs leading to the floors above. One not only makes the journey towards more modern forms of paintings from the 18th to the 19th and finally the 20th, but also from a predominantly European art style to something that is more homegrown. The transition from James Bailey Fraser to the likes of Nandalal Bosch and Jomini Roy is one that harkens back to Calcutta's own history, that of colonized Bengali subservient to the company, to the Bengali who found his or her own identity in the quest for Swaraj, and finally to the Bengali culture of the late 20th century. As Kishore Singh put it, I wonder what modern art in India would have been without Kolkata's humongous contribution. Creating a museum display for an informed audience was intimidating for us. We were conscious that we were reflecting the creation of art in Kolkata from the very inception of the city. There are exquisite Kalighat paths, the amazing popular prints that were created in her bazaars, the prints and paintings made by European artists, and their understanding of the landscapes and of people, as also the modern movements and artists who have been affiliated with the nationalist movement as well as operated independently. Kolkata's or Bengal's contribution to the nine national treasure artists stands at an astounding six. Its art reflects lyricism, pathos, beauty, and melancholy in equal measure. If only it had been better documented, art in Kolkata would have rivaled and been talked about in the same breath as art centers such as that of Paris, London, and New York. I can't describe in words how amazing it felt to walk through the corridors of the old currency building and to learn more about Bengal's rich cultural legacy. Both Shumona Chakraborty and Shujan Mukherjee, the head of education and outreach at Kodebare, were exemplary guides throughout and the interest, knowledge and love for art shone through like the glowing halo of wisdom. DAG as a private organization stands for the custodianship of art as a national treasure that belongs to everyone equally, irrespective of ownership. This belief and the cultivation of this belief among the populace is of great importance and DAG has turned this noble idea into something that real and tangible. Special thank you to Shumana Chakraborty and Shujan Mukherjee who were kind enough to guide us through the entire museum and to Mr. Kishore Singh for taking the time out of his busy schedule and answering our questions.